Hi, Owen. Hey, Bob. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I am excellent. I'm very, uh, very much looking forward to this conversation. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show. You are Owen Ellickson, like a comedy guy. Is that the way you introduce yourself? I think that is actually eerily close to how I would describe myself. Yeah, I am a TV writer professionally, um, currently working for a show called Superstore, um, and that's about all I have to recommend me. Well, actually, there's more. Let me, uh, I'm going to read uh, from the beginning of a, a New York Times piece that was kind of about you that uh, appeared, uh, I guess, in October of last year. And the headline was, The Trump Dialogues from a Parody Universe. The comedy writer Owen Ellickson sent hundreds of tweets this summer as he pushed the boundaries of the year's definitive comic genre, political parody in miniature. Mr. Ellickson, 38, who wrote for NBC's The Office and CBS is the King of Queens and currently works on NBC's Superstore, has turned the caricature of Donald J. Trump into imagined dialogues he calls Trump leaks. The scenes purport to be snippets of conversation among Mr. Trump and other well-known Republicans, including Speaker Paul D. Ryan of Wisconsin, of Wisconsin Governor Chris Christie of New Jersey, and they have vaulted the comedy writer to cult celebrity on Twitter, <laughs> something to which all of us aspire, by the way. Few of us succeed, taking him from about... 1,700 followers in early June to nearly 65,000 as of Tuesday. So that's a, a growth in a few months. Congratulations on that. And as that says, you're actually very accomplished in the realm of TV comedy. In fact, if you go to the, what is the database? IMD. IMDB, Internet Movie Database. That's what it stands for. There's like a ton of stuff. And you know, I'm not like a TV person. Like for most of my adult life, uh... I have not watched basically any TV, but even I am conversant with some of the shows you've been associated with. You wrote a number of episodes of The Office, super, super famous show, and I, produced a number. Uh, I did, yes. I, I was not on what, for what most would call the peak years, but uh, loved working there. Uh, I was there after Steve Carell left, and I would actually recommend choosing him over me if you're uh, you going You're forced into to choose? Yeah, I, you pretty much are. That's so charmingly self-deprecatory of you. <laughs> but you know, it's not good marketing. Sure. You're not, you weren't supposed to, I would not, if I were your agent, do you have an agent? I do. If your agent is watching, I think you're in trouble. <laughs> you're not, you're not supposed to say things like that. Anyway, uh, there are these, uh, what are other, what are other shows you would like to, you, some of your shows have like a cult following of their own, right? Some of these shows you've been associated with? Yeah. Um, so I started on uh, King of Queens. I was a writer's assistant there, which basically means no taker and a proofreader. Got promoted to writer. Um, that was a very lucky thing for a young man. Um, then I sort of bounced around on a couple things. I um, was on the office for a couple years. I briefly ran a show on uh, Yahoo uh, for a guy named Paul Feig, a director. Um, sort of a sci-fi comedy called Other Space, which was a lot of fun. But Yahoo pretty quickly learned they had no business model whatsoever for television. So this we accounts had a, for their recent purchase by another company. Indeed, Oath, I suppose, is now what we're calling it. Uh, and then I've been on Superstore uh, now in my third season. Not not mm -hmm. steering it or anything, just sort of a member of the crew. Um, but I've had a very lucky career and uh, hopefully learned some stuff. I don't know. Okay. So we're going to talk about comedy in the age of Trump, also maybe comedy in the age of political polarization and tribalism, and maybe close by talking about uh, political polarization and uh, tribalism in their own right. Um, but let's do start talking about uh, comedy in the age of Trump. I mean, for starters, you uh, you quit doing those those uh the things the new york times was alluding to and i and i want to get into a few of those uh and dissect them uh with you but 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 first um why did you at some point you stopped right uh i stopped the night of the election um and in the event of a, a hillary clinton win which i was anticipating like most people i was planning on quitting anyway um i had sort of gotten tired of doing it and it felt like i was telling I was sort of, by the end, I was sort of telling an overall story that um, I don't think would stand up to much scrutiny, but seemed very fun to some people in Twitter form. Um, and it felt like it was all sort of coming to a head that night. So, yeah, I started in 
mayor June of 2016 and ended the night of the election. So it wasn't just, I mean, the reason you quit doing it wasn't just that, hey, this is funny if you don't really think he's going to be president, but it's too serious to laugh at once. The... A little bit, yeah. I mean, I, I was sick of it anyway, but, but I mean, uh, I'll admit I feel pretty sheepish about the project overall. Um, I mean, even calling it a project, I feel sheepish about because it was just a bunch of dumb ramblings on the internet. But um, one of the real foundational assumptions of it was that he was going to lose, that all the foolishness going on in his camp and elsewhere in the Republican Party was going to be to no avail. Um, so, I, you know, it was very much a situation where not only did I feel like I had joked around about something that ended up being more high stakes than I had thought, but I had sort of projected a confidence about understanding the nature of what I was following, which turned out to be wrong. Uh, you you I mean, mean in the sense that, that the project presupposed that he wouldn't win? Yes, um, I mean, you know, it's I sort of, not very that's not very clear, uh, to be honest. I mean, I, it wasn't it didn't occur to me as I read over these. But no. Yeah, I, I don't think that it necessarily pervades all of them. Um, but it it I think part of the reason I enjoyed doing it was it felt sort of like this self-contained little ugly chapter um, that we all in thought American history that yeah. had not to be. So with your permission, I would just like to read a few of these. Right, now, what is your philosophy? Is your philosophy that comedy should never be dissected? It, it, it resists analysis and, like, we shouldn't talk about it? No, I actually sort of enjoy the dissection <laughs> of comedy. I would say the dissection of comedy d does tend to sort of murder the funniness of whatever one dissects. Right. But but uh, so be it. I'm, I'm not too enamored with these tweets. At this okay. Point. <laughs> so, but there's this... Siri did this, and by the way, if people want what I think is a good compilation of these, we'll link to what Wired Magazine did. I mean, the New York Times piece listed a few, but Wired Magazine did a long, uh, they, they kind of, I don't know, they storified them, or somebody had storified them, and they linked to the storification or something, but we'll link to that. And uh, so there was a series you did <laughs> having to do with Trump's penchant for the phrase, like a dog, like in his uh, yeah. tweets, it was like, she cheated on him like a dog. He choked like a dog. So you did a bunch of these, and I just want to read a few. And then if you don't feel, if you're too self-conscious to say what you think is funny, I'll say what I think is funny. It's up to you. Okay. I, I will uh, try not to writhe too much. As uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. So you're painfully no, self-conscious. No. Is, is this like a general thing? Should we I like... Deserve should we just avoid referring to you at all? Should I like refer to you as another name? Should I call you Jim? Is this whole thing hurting too much? Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Um, so anyway, these are supposed Trump tweets that aren't really. <clears throat> so uh, here's one. To our enemies, Obama is a joke. Such a nervous, sweaty guy. Always sweating through his sweat, sweat glands. Like a dog. Do you have any comment on that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, well, we, we, yeah. You want I, to move I, on to the next one? Or, I, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> oh, well, but I'll tell you what, I, I mean, it's just funny because, well, there's just something about the fact that, yeah, everybody sweats through their sweat glands. I don't know what it is that's funny about that, but it, it's, it's, yes, and all mammals do. I mean, yeah. well, or that, look, all people have... There's something stupid about each of these tweets, and of course that's part of the joke when you're talking about Trump. Since without yes. casting any judgments on the man's intellect myself, I would say that the premise of your uh, of some of these is that he's not very smart. Um, I would agree. Uh, and I would say that even at the height of my own delight with my own work, I, I thought they were all sort of gleefully stupid. I mean, that was sort of the, the highest mountain I thought I was climbing. Yeah. So it's stupid that he doesn't realize that all people sweat through <laughs> Sweat glands. It's true that Obama has that in common with the dog, but so do you, Donald. Um, <clears throat> okay, next one. Nobody cares what Mitt Romney thinks. This is a guy who uses echolocation to fly around like a dog. No clue. Do you have any comment? Well, so I was trying to specifically identify animal traits that dogs did not have. <laughs> yes. uh, and so. this was like... The uh, most absurd <laughs> one you could di just about come. I mean, this is another thing you'd have to be super stupid to say, to not know that dogs do not use echolocation. Yes. And I, I, I would maybe push back on the idea of him being 
stupid, but we can talk about that. Uh, well, go ahead. Well, go ahead. Back. Well, I think uh, I, I, so I sort of came to this through, um, you know, I, I sort of, my main encounters with Donald Trump previous to this were through a wrestling context. He is a guy who uh, hosted WrestleManias four and five at uh, the Trump Taj Mahal uh, and has been a character of some import at various points. Uh, there was, I think, WrestleMania 23. His hair was on the line against Vince McMahon's hair uh, in a match that I believe drew the, drew the most money in wrestling history up to that point. Um, so uh, he, I mean, he, he strikes me as a wrestling figure. He's very good at a certain type of male theater. Um, the things he doesn't care about, he really doesn't care about and is not curious about. And ideally for all of our sakes, it would be good if he were more curious about them right now. But I think he has certain skills. And I tried to, uh, in my tweets, indicate that, that he is, in some ways, he ran circles around the Republican Party. Uh, although I think in some ways he's also in keeping with their some of their uglier traditions. So, mm -hmm. um, sorry to slow things down. No, Keep no, 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 no. That, that's, um, <laughs> now I'm echoing a little, I'm going to pull this out and see if that changes it. Now I'm not echoing. That's better. Um, so, uh, let me read one more in this series of, uh, Let's talk. like a dog tweets. John Kasich's corkscrew shaped penis allows him to have sex with, I'm sorry. With other ducks, like a dog. You call that leadership a disgrace? Yeah, I like. I, 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 I'll cop to still sort of liking that one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, can you articulate what's funny about it? I mean, something definitely is. Uh, well, I mean, he he's going to great lengths to describe something that could only be a duck, uh, and then slapping the dog label on it, right. uh, and then ending with a few Trump handles, which uh, yeah, there's also M A G A the the hashtag M A G A. I did, I, I, I left that off. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, the, you're right. I, this is wonderful stuff. I did. <laughs> this is the world is ennobled by such tweets. Um, so, but but is it now harder? I mean, I take it your position is. It is now harder to be that lighthearted. I mean, you could have kept this up. You know, I, I mean, yeah. I'm sure you could find a version of this that would continue to get wildly retweeted. Uh, I think I that's potentially true, yeah. Um, I mean, I, you know, I think that there was, in the way that there was fatigue about all things him uh, after the election and really continuing until now, uh, I think I was annoying more and more people with my tweets uh, as we got closer to the election. I remained blocked by a number of uh, <laughs> a number of people just for being so loud and kind of annoying on Twitter. Um, I think there still potentially might be an appetite for it, and I don't judge that appetite. I just don't really want to take part in it. And it also, it was a pretty time-intensive thing because I was trying to sort of, on a daily basis, as news would come out, trying to sort of in real time, right behind the scenes dialogues related to that news. So um, it was something that I sort of didn't regard as sustainable just in terms of a time commitment. And I just would have felt icky uh, going into now when so many lives really are tangibly uh, at his mercy. Yeah. Quote unquote. So your Twitter feed is pretty serious now by and large, right? It's like a concerned citizens Twitter feed basically. I would say that's right. I mean, I, I slowly uh, have reintroduced my pre-Trump uh, sort of Twitter pursuits, which is just sort of extremely boring stuff about myself, my trips to the grocery store, my thoughts on wrestling and basketball. Uh, but I would say during the day, it's mainly retweeting and trying to sort of signal boost various causes. I feel like I perhaps illegitimately got myself a platform through talking about this stuff. So the least I can do is try to send some information around uh, with it now. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about one other thing and ask you if you took heat for it. Um, you did, uh, earlier this spring, you did a series of things that, that uh, were uh, in New York Magazine. Um, and we can link to those. And I, I thought they were very funny. I mean, there was Steve Bannon's leaked Oval Office screenplay, uh, which I guess may have been uh, stimulated by the fact that one of his earlier screenplays did come to light about the United States of Islam or whatever the hell it was. Um, right. There was one that I thought was was 
Uh, Barry Finn, I wanted to ask you if you took heat for it. It's Sebastian Gorka leaves a note for his McDonald's server. Right. And Sebastian Gorka is, of course, this uh, uh, flake with allegedly Nazi sympathies who who is in the Trump administration. Uh, and, and his claims about his own credentials have been called into question and so on. Yes. Uh, massive head. Um, there have been a couple of photos of him next to other people. Um, kudos to him on his head size. Large head. As somebody with not a... So, yeah. Yeah, it's the kind of thing um, I, you have to be gifted with. Exactly. Um, I did not receive heat that I saw. Um, uh, one thing I've done in the last couple of months is on Twitter, there's a setting that you, you can only receive notifications from people that you yourself follow. Um, and I switched to that just to sort of kind of cut down on the volume of stuff I was seeing. So I didn't see pushback against what I did there. Uh, but, uh, and he had already blocked me uh, long before. Sebastian <laughs> himself. Twitter, so. There's no point in going yes. into it, but the premise was he's sitting in a, it's a note he writes on a napkin to a server and you've actually written it out and that's part of the humor. That's why there's no point in reading from it. Some things are underlined. Some things are in all caps. Right. And it's, it's, uh, I'm wondering how something like that occurs to you. I mean, well, what, well, let me tell you, what I thought you might take heat for was, like, the premise, if part of the premise is he's the kind of guy who would hang out at a McDonald's, well, then is that a statement about the demographic of McDonald's, right? In other words, you could get heat from the left for that. But you uh, that is, yeah, that that is a possibility. I wrote that at a McDonald's uh, after eating okay. its food. Uh, That's insulating I, uh, yourself. Okay. I, I would say I subscribe to the, is it Chris Arnaud? Chris Arnaud? A-R-N-A-U-D, uh, whatever, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I am a fast food consumer myself, uh, and I think certain types of critiques like that from the left uh, are kind of silly and counterproductive. So uh, I was not trying to impugn him by saying he went to McDonald's. I was trying to impugn him by saying he ordered badly there. Yeah. And, and exhibited other eccentricities that people will see if they uh, click on the link we'll provide. Um, yeah. Okay, so who who do you... Are there people you think are doing a good job of handling the challenge of comedy in the age of Trump? Well, I mean, I think he himself as a subject is... I mean, the interesting thing about him, and I, you know, and, and I don't say this to say that my attempt to be funny about him necessarily succeeded at all, but... He, I feel like he sort of came into the world pre-mocked, like that's almost sort of uh, part of his persona that, you know, uh, Spy Magazine making fun of his hands goes back almost as far as him being a figure of real renown. Um, uh, I feel like there was a McKay Coppins article about him last summer that I feel like sort of crystallized for me that people occasionally joked that about how he was sort of like the Joker and agent of chaos, but I feel like he's actually more like, uh, in the Tim Burton film, Batman returns, he's actually more like Danny DeVito's penguin where he sort of grew up very close to New York high society, but there was something about him that people thought was silly or gauche. Uh, and his whole life has been sort of an angry retort to that. Um, so, you know, when people mock him and call him orange or small handed or, say he's Trump instead of Trump, you know, you're not really accomplishing anything. I mean, he sort of made his bones on people say these jokes about me, fuck them, and let's show them, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. So I actually think it's pretty tough territory to um, to get a lot of sort of interesting humor out of. Um, I would say there's a show on Comedy Central called The President Show, um, and the uh, guy, he's an improv guy who plays Trump there, his name is Anthony Adam Manick, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. He does a very inspired Donald Trump impression, um, and I will not attempt to uh, mm. impersonate Donald Trump right now. But Alec Baldwin's SNL impression, I think, is is okay, but it's very blowhardy and aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, I think Adam Manick does the r sort of funnier thing, which is a combination of aggression and then like these moments of intense timidity, which uh, I think are sort of right about how Trump both acts and talks. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the SNL stuff in general? I mean, uh, I mean, on a performative level, they have some really transcendent people. I think Kate McKinnon and Melissa McCarthy and, and people like that are really great. I think it's okay. Um, I mean, 
and, and again, this is something that I, I will cop to doing too, but I, I think to a, SNL falls prone to something that people occasionally call clapter, which is that um, if you make a joke that sort of aligns with the beliefs of the audience, um, they will be so excited about it that they will give it credit as though it were funnier than it was. Um, so I think that uh, a fair amount of what happens on there sort of falls under that category. And that's true of, you know, most things. I would think The Daily Show and such things. That, that was kind of my thinking when I first saw the, Al the Alec Baldwin impersonation, to be honest. It's like any, any version of ridiculing Trump would have gotten laughs just because yeah. people want... want wanted so much yeah no i i mean i think there is a and you know a lot of people are i think very understandably angry at him angry at the idea of him being president and you know humor is uh, one of our big catharses so um and look you would not have thought to talk to me if i had not made fun of the guy so <laughs> i can't that's true was that versions. your secret aim all along to get on blogging heads did well, that as, launch the, is that is this like a year-long project for you <laughs> finally <laughs> Far longer culmination. Than well, as you know, Bob, I uh, as I've told you, I have been a longtime Blogging Heads fan uh, and proponent. So this actually is uh, this is the most dazzle that I've been since I met Ric Flair. So I, I I'm not going to even hint that I am totally out of it when it comes to current goings on. But who the hell is that? Ric Flair is a legendary wrestler. Uh, oh, my yes. bad, my bad. It's your boy. You're bad indeed. Yeah, honestly. Uh, should have known. Um. And what what about uh, the late night hosts? You've got your Stephen Colbert. You've got your Jimmy Fallon. Is Fallon is the one who who tussled his hair, right? Trump's hair, and and I'm saw like eighty point ratings drop as a result or something. <laughs> yeah, I you know I I I don't find Jimmy Fallon all that funny personally, but I I sympathize in a certain sense. I mean, he's trying to steer clear of this sort of partisan thing, and I think you could call that cowardly, or you could say that. Maybe it's okay if somebody tries to not, you know, take part in this sort of Manichaean struggle. Um, having said that, I think the way he doesn't take part in it is not that funny. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not that into him. Uh, what about boy, Colbert? This, this, is, this is just me systematically uh, downgrading my career. You know, I was, it's funny. When I, I thought about asking you these questions, <laughs> I thought, Surely this guy has the wisdom not to answer these questions. I'm so happy that I that I overestimated you by a long shot. Uh, well, let me let me just throw in the caveat: all these people are brilliant, uh, wonderful people, wonderful to work with, and I'm sure for. Um, I think Colbert is a brilliant performer. I loved his uh, Comedy Central show. Um, I I mean, part of it is I just happen not to be watching any of these people regularly. I think Colbert does what he does very well. Um, but it is, you know, he's the sort of assumptions of what he's doing are you like me dislike Trump. Um, you know, there's sort of what you might call, for lack of a better term, sort of mainstream de Democratic Party assumptions behind sort of the angle of what he's doing. Um, and I agree with a number of them, but uh, it just it, it's not something I find super exciting comedically mm -hmm. currently. By the way, I go. was on the Colbert show. That was the acme of my 15 minutes. Were you really? I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It was great. Well, was, uh, talking about one of your books? Uh, last one, The Evolution of God. He was, he's ama he was funny. Um, yeah, he's a force. So, uh, yeah, and what do you, well, actually, quickly, what was your view of Jon Stewart? Now, there's somebody who can't hurt you, right? There Where's you go. he these days? Go ahead, unload. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, I think he's a great performer and I think that was and is a brilliantly written show. It, um, it, it's funny because, again, I am uh, speaking to you as a guy who sort of, you know, did a series of things along similar lines. It, it felt self-congratulatory to me at times. I, I think in a way that's not like totally Like almost fair constantly me. in my view. I was just never yes. a huge Stewart fan. I mean, some of the... The, some of the lines were funny. Some of the script was funny. It was just so uh, infused with sanctimony. Yeah. You know, that... And, and then he would sometimes... And then when he would make that clear by doing kind of explicit 
editorializing in like a screaming voice, you know, I don't know. Um, I, 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 I seem to be almost entirely alone. Uh, no, I mean, I, yeah, I, I would say that in fairness, I think what he is, was trying to do was something that I, it's almost impossible that I would like, um, and he may have made a pretty good effort at it. But, I mean, you know, I would say that I enjoyed that show and thought it was pretty good when I watched it, but I never really got into a habit of watching it regularly. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. So, um, by way of, let's, let's move to, uh, let's try to segue to the subject of political polarization and tribalism. But first, let's pause for one more of your uh, tweets. Okay. I wanted to dissect this. <clears throat> so, this is not... Trump tweeting. This is an imagined conversation between Trump and his uh, aides, and 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 he's talking to Chris Christie, and they're trying to line up a speaker for the convention. And Trump says, uh, "Tyson passed. We need another convention speaker, Chris." And then it says Christie perks up, adjusts his tie, and then Trump says, "Get Joey Buttafuoco on the phone." Now, for starters. At the minimal level, it, that's kind of a, a standard, like, sitcom moment where someone falsely thinks that they yeah. are going to, you know, get the glory or the promotion, and it's done in a funny way. But there's more to it than that, right? So Christy thinks he's going to get to speak, and no, he just wants to call Joey Buttafugo. Right. Do you want to say any more about it? If not, I will tell you what I think is further funny about that. I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll throw out what I believe I was going for. <laughs> um, I mean, I, because Trump is sort of an 80s, early 90s artifact himself, one of the things I liked portraying was those were all the names that came to his head first. Um, and I don't know. Yeah, I had a lot of fun with Chris Christie as a character who, I mean, just the combination of him, and I, I was not, you know, far from the only person to notice this, the combination of his sort of blowhardiness combined with being such a lapdog for Trump uh, is just a delightful contrast. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, that's, that's a good example of all the shortcuts I took in those tweets that really I was, I was using the ideas of Donald Trump and Chris Christie to do most of the work for me. But, um, but if you can find something better in there, go for well, it. Well, I mean, I guess I'd say, first of all, for our younger viewers, Let's talk a little about who Joey Buttafuoco was. Sure. This because this was in the early '90s, and he was just this Long Island guy who was having an affair with a Long Island uh, high school, you know, teenage girl. And something about the affair inspired the girl, whose name was Amy Fisher, to go to his house and shoot his wife in the face, as I recall, or in the, or something. Yes. She lived; she didn't die. Yeah. But and th this became a huge case. And I assume that people like, uh, I think I can almost remember David Letterman having fun with the last name Joey Buttafuoco. Yes. Uh, but it became this huge, and to me, the additional, so this, first of all, it isn't just that Christie is disappointed. It's just that the guy who is getting the speaking slot is like the biggest low life you can imagine. But B, this is what I like, is in a certain sense, Joey Buttafuoco is the kind of guy Trump would actually admire, right? Yes. I mean, hey, he's getting some young action. Plus, he doesn't have to shoot his wife. He got the chick to do it, <laughs> right? I mean... I've gone there with it, but, I, but that's a fair point. I, I mean, so anyway, you're more, you're more of a genius than you realize. <laughs> now back to uh, political polarization. Um, so I was thinking about this... Well, two things. I mean, you know, I've heard people say... Gosh, if only John Stewart had been around, Trump would would not have won. I think you can make the case that Trump would have won by more because his voters were like energized by the thought that people held him and people like them in contempt. And although Stewart didn't express a lot of contempt for the voters explicitly, I, I'm I'm just not sure that contempt for Trump hurt his cause. I would uh, I would strongly agree with that. I mean, I, and I think you know a guy like John Oliver, and again, I think he's a great performer, and the writers on that are top notch. Um, you know, he he did a, he had sort of a signature takedown of of Trump on his show, where he uh, I think he pioneered a hashtag about Trump, which I guess is the historical family name, and you know a lot of people found it sort of intensely satisfying as a takedown of Trump, but. Uh, 
you know, <laughs> the idea that anybody, anybody's mind would have been changed by it, that anybody was on the fence and then sat down to watch Last Week Tonight with John Oliver <laughs> and then realized he made some good points about Trump. I mean, no, no such unicorn exists on this earth. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, we had John Stewart equivalents firing away, and that's not what's going to get us out of this uh, polarized climate. Yeah, and, you know, getting back to Stephen Colbert, uh, he famously did this, you know, this thing, the thing that got famously bleeped. Uh, it has the, the word holster in it. Yeah. Probably everyone knows. Uh, you know, I just wonder, like, doesn't that actually hurt his cause? I mean, you know, it gets out there. Every, he's, he's showing huge, uh, obviously, disrespect to the president. And I can see it. It's hard not. I find it personally, given my view, I find it hard not to. But but it's like w when you ask, well, what effect does that have on the people who support him? Or in that case, even the people who kind of just marginally support him in the Republican Party, not only his hardcore supporters, yeah. It's pretty predictable that this is only going to gonna harden the base in that sense. But um, even, you know, just your garden variety, conservative, like, I, it just seems to me something... Uh, do you think I'm crazy to think that that, if anything, does damage to Stephen Colbert's cause? I, I think it probably does. And I think in fairness to him that that was a little bit of an aberration, that, that that was farther than he usually goes. He made a point of not apologizing, but I... My guess would be in private he he kind of would rather that he hadn't said that joke. Um, By the way, the other thing in fairness to him is it was kind of taken out of context. The, the setup for that whole riff had been, okay, I'm going to unload on this guy. So it wasn't just yeah. like another one-liner. It was a series of extreme insults, and that was a kind of a culmination. But anyway. It, it was, if, if right, exactly. He... It was explicitly the night he was going to go after Trump the most viciously. Um, I, you know, I personally would have ironically kept that joke in the holster. But uh, I, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think stuff like that, you know, it, it, it cheers, you know, it thrills the people who hate Trump. Probably in the scheme of things, it doesn't accomplish anything and might be very incrementally counterproductive. Mm -hmm. um, so I would agree with you on that. Uh, ditto this Kathy Griffin thing that just happened where she held up a bloody Trump head. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so is there, like, anything comedians can do? Or, or, or is there, is there I, I mean, comedians who earnestly think Trump is dangerous would like to minimize the chances that he gets reelected uh, or even maximize the chances that he leaves office before that. Is there, is there kind of anything they can do? You know, I, it's hard for me to say, and I should say I'm not a comedian. I'm just a right. behind the scenes guy. Um, I I don't know that there particularly is. I mean, I think that there is. You know, I don't have a. Uh, I haven't been watching a ton of stand up lately. We have two little kids, and I my sort of cultural consumption is lower than it used to be on a given day. But um, I kind of feel like even in the world of stand ups, there's increasingly sort of a a blue array of stand ups and a red array of stand ups. Um, so, you know, the degree to which you can get stuff across, uh, I think maybe fairly limited at this point. Um, I would say, uh, again, I think, you know, the, the Trump related comedy I find most interesting right now is this, uh, president show on comedy central. And that is a show that has a certain kind of occasional empathy for Trump. You know, it will sort of briefly dip into how sad he and lonely he feels. Uh, and I feel like, that kind of is the most effective. I mean, I think humanizing somebody is is kind of depolarizing, and also it does go against his sort of brittle, macho posturing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I do think that, you know, by the same token that I, I feel like he sort of rose through a certain kind of, like, weaponized tough boy rhetoric that pointing out when he is weak and sort of fragile, uh, that's the kind of stuff that, would anger him the most, which is not necessarily the best metric to use, but is, I think, still notable nonetheless. I think, you know, pointing out that he's corrupt, I, I think he kind of campaigned on being corrupt. I think he said, you know, there was, there was sort of a wink in his campaign that said, look, maybe I'm dirty, but Hillary's dirty too, and I'm more fun, you know, and that did well enough to win. So 
you know, I think attacks along corruption lines are are not ones that comedians could make too much hay with, frankly. Mm -hmm. and by so, the way, who are the red stand-up comics? The only one that comes to my mind is Dennis Miller. Um, there, are, there are a number. Um, I, I mean, Tim Allen, I don't think does too much stand-up anymore. But his mm -hmm. show, Last Man Standing, was just canceled despite fairly good ratings, and I know that uh, that was sort of a cause celebre for some on the right that they thought it was for political reasons that uh, his show was canceled. Uh, Roseanne Barr is now very much on the right. In terms of sort of active touring stand-ups, um, I I'm not actually that sure. Uh, Didn't Roseanne honest. Barr used to be on the far left, or am I imagining that, like 20 years so. ago? I, I think she's a uh, pretty pretty hard one to pin down. Mm. Um, uh, okay, uh, so it's just, it's, I, I think, you know, I, I don't know that that's unbridgeable. I, I'm not sure there could be a purple stand-up comic, right? Um, I'm, well, yeah, I mean, I don't think that there could be a an explicitly political uh, purple stand-up comic right now. I mean, I think that, you know, comedy that everybody can still go for is character comedy. I mean, you know, when there's sort of a story about a human being, um, you know, a lot of people from varied backgrounds and ideologies can can engage with a story about a person mm -hmm. as opposed to somebody saying this is what I think. And that's more like what you do. I mean, as you said, you're not you're not either a performer or a writer in the, in the realm of stand-up comedy. Right. I mean, I right. will say, you know, looking back, and I don't know whether such things are possible anymore, but people like Johnny Carson used to have a policy of equally ridiculing left and right. And this is the model Jimmy Fallon was trying to follow and then discovered it was a bad time to try to follow it, I guess. But, right. um, but, but you know, that made them unifying cultural forces. Right. And, I don't, you know, but anyway... Yeah, no, I mean, I think I, I think that is tr harder now because um, people are so likely to argue about the refs that saying, you know, the ratio really was not as even as you claim it was. Good point. Um, I think, you know, they're also, and this is the kind of thing that a place like Twitter can obscure, you know, I, I, Twitter makes it seem like there are, there's a horrible rift uh, on the left between, you know, simplistically the Bernie wing and the Hillary wing. I think, it, you know, if you look at sort of overall polling, that's less true of the public writ large than within the world of left Twitter. But um, that's another thing where, you know, I think that cohort can't even agree on what the funny jokes would be about themselves. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a very fractured time. And I, I would say, you know, Twitter is, again, the reason you perhaps mistakenly thought I was worth talking to. I think Twitter is... I don't regret it yet, but we still have 20 minutes to go. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll show you yet. Um, I think Twitter is a brilliantly efficient polarizing machine in that, um, you know, it's just these perfect little tiny, basically sugar pills. Like, most people use Twitter to say, this is a thing I agree with, this is a thing that I like. Uh, I know you yourself have talked about... Um, what twi Twitter needs is a, a to be sure paragraph. Didn't you mention that in something? Yeah, I wrote. We can link to that. I thought. I I think this is one of <clears throat> of the many great overlooked ideas I've had. This is in the top, you know, three million or so. The the uh, the the idea was yeah that that it would still be limited to 140 characters, but there'd be a little icon you could add at the end, and if people click it, there's a drop down, and you get another like 400 characters to elaborate. Uh, because so often that's my feeling is like the reason I don't want to tweet at all is because, you know, I just say the main thing I'm going to say without qualification, uh, you know, it'll be taken the yeah. wrong way. Well, I agree with you that that feature would make Twitter a, a healthier environment. And I think that people in part love Twitter because nothing like that exists. They like it to be these kind of little shards that they can either agree with or sort of tear apart as they see fit. Um, I think that is some of the sort of specific appeal of Twitter is that it is so simplistic and, and sanded down. Yeah, although people are now getting around it by doing the tweet storms, right? That's become a, a, yeah. a, a thing. This was, in a way, the same idea. I mean, the idea here, there was a whole business model for Twitter idea here because the next step after this was linking to a place where you could write, like, infinitely, and all yeah. of this would be ad space for Twitter. 
I right. mean, the idea is like Twitter is full of people who want to be writer. They want to produce content for free. They want to produce more for free, voluminous right. content. And I was saying like Twitter should let them and serve ads next to it. But anyway, yeah. I digress. The uh, Twitter is, and the other thing you're noticing now is like Twitter steers you toward being a polarizing force because if yeah. you look at what gets retweeted. Yeah. And you see some of these people building up huge followings. Um, yeah. In some cases, I think cynically, so I definitely won't mention any names. But, um, and you know, you if you don't say something that is kind of snidely or sarcastically or viciously anti-Trump, as a general rule, you just don't get any retweet. You don't get any positive reinforcement. Unless right. you go to the other extreme and have a red Twitter base. Exactly. I was going to say, you, yeah. you and I probably exist in kind of a sure, bluish sure. cloud. Sure. Um, I think that's right. And, I, you know, that was sort of instructive in my my dumb Trump tweets. Uh, I, you know, in the part I might feel the most sheepish about was that I occasionally uh, included Hillary into the dialogues. Um, I had them have a brief phone call the night of his convention speech and then sort of featured her occasionally. And I noticed that those did really well, especially when I sort of, you know, for lack of a better term, presented her in sort of a rah-rah way of, you know, our girl can do this. And, I, you know, I did vote for her. Um, I think she would have been a credible president. Um, but, you know, I, A, I'm ambivalent about certain things about her and her campaign, and B, you know, I, I just regard that as a little bit of a cheap trick, and I think that uh, the the attention those tweets got sort of seduced me a little bit. So um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that you know, even even before the results of the election, I was I'd been reading sort of social science stuff like Daniel Kahneman and Jonathan Haidt, who you've had on, uh, and just sort of trying to examine like why I think the things I think, and you know, often the answer is because it feels good to think them. Um, I think that's and, always the answer in my yeah, own view, but probably is more or less always the answer that even if I complexify my thinking, it's because I, I enjoy the idea that I'm complexifying my thinking and find myself to be a more substantive person for doing so. Um, and I think in some ways, you know, my support of Hillary Clinton, I flattered myself as a, well, it, it takes a very sophisticated observer to uh, <laughs> to wade through the the murkiness of the Clinton legacy. Blah 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 blah. So um, anyway, I'm sort of rambling here, but uh, but yeah, no, I think that's right. I think that it's very easy to find people that agree with you, um, and it's kind of seductive. And I don't know that it's productive uh, mm -hmm. entirely, or at least it's not productive to the exclusion of everything else when done to the exclusion of everything else. Yeah. So, uh, what is to be done? Um, bef before we, uh, when we, you and I were just talking before we pressed record, you said you you would be interested as a longtime Blogging Heads uh, viewer slash listener in talking a little about Blogging Heads in this context, which is uh, fine by me. I love talking about Blogging Heads. Yeah, no, I, I've been... Uh, a blogging heads consumer since 2008. Uh, spent a little time on the message board before I sort of. That's another thing I think that. Oh, what uh, was your what was your? Uh... Uh, same as my Twitter handle O N L X N. I didn't I didn't uh, I didn't contribute too much. Mm -hmm. I sort of got disenchanted with the idea of arguing with people on the internet. But um, uh, not that I was super, uh, you know, combative. But um, yeah, I mean, I've always thought this was a sort of worthwhile space in terms of you try to get people together to discuss things civilly often along you know across tribal lines uh, obviously the DMZ being the sort of most notable example of that on a weekly basis um, it does seem to me that that is one of your projects despite you being you know a, solidly on the progressive side of things uh, although I'm sure you m might be able to sort of find some caveats there if you were so inclined um, so just as somebody who is sort of engaged in a project against tribalism, how do you feel like that project is going currently? <laughs> well, on balance, <laughs> I'd say the signs are not good. I mean, it's... Uh, and it's funny, of course, I think, you know, <clears throat> along with a lot of people, I think a lot of the problem is technological. 
Um, you know, much has been said about this. Technology allows you to cocoon yourself into, you know, an echo chamber and so on. Um, and it does, and it's, uh, it's kind of hard to fight that tendency. I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, we, in a weird way, we were like among the very first podcasters. Because there was, you know, we started in 2000, what, five, And there was yeah. always an audio. You could always download an audio, even though it was video. Yeah. And, um, you know, the idea was the, the, was about video. The idea was the recognition that video casting was about to go even narrower than cable, right. thanks to the Internet. And we figured out a way to make that happen. This was before Skype. We, you, you know, we, we had to figure out a way to kind of do it. Um, so that was the idea. It was a video idea. But from the beginning, it was, in a, in a sense, uh, a podcast and... So we were there at the beginning. Now, I have failed to turn this into some universally known podcast empire, obviously. And there are lots of reasons for that having to do mainly with my own shortcomings. But but as far as, if you just fast forward to now and ask, well, what does it take to become a, a globally known podcast juggernaut? you got to go tribal, as far as I can tell. I mean, you know, you, you like, like one of the hottest uh, progressive podcasts is Chapo Trap House. Have you listened to this? Sure. And, you know, it's it's uh, it's interesting. I've only listened to a few. It's obviously not aimed at my demographic. So right. I would in no universe be, you know, <clears throat> the ideal, the greatest enthusiast. But I think it's it's kind of it's kind of, uh, you know, they're definitely smart. It's funny sometimes. It's great. But yeah. it's totally, totally preaching to the choir and mobilizing the choir and not at all about outreach. Yeah, no, and I, I, I'm sure they would agree with that. I, I, I don't think they, they think it's anything other than that. Yeah, I would agree. I've, I've listened to several. I think they're, they're funny folks, and there's an energy to it. But it is, you know, if you are uh, on the socialist end of the spectrum, it is manna from heaven. If you're not, you know, they, they don't particularly uh, reach out a hand. And you know, again, I don't know that they have to. I think there's a place for that, and maybe for a kind of less popular. Uh, ideology like that there is value in having a sort of loud and proud place um you know that i can see that being sort of an underserved population and you being excited to find a place like that uh but yeah no they're they're not uh i don't think they're interested in purple they're barely interested in blue so but they're like um somebody told me that uh was it they make on patreon they make was it sixty thousand dollars a week or a month Believe a month. I heard. I heard largely. But that's say. like real. That's real money. I mean, yeah. you, you know, uh, for something that just you know pulled itself up by its bootstraps. Yeah. Um, I don't think they have advertising, but uh, but anyway, so that you know, that's that you can just tell on Twitter and podcasts if you want to build an audience, and of course we all want to build audiences. Um, yeah. You know, you go tribal, either right, right. or left. Right. Uh, yeah, no, and, and I do think that there is sort of an additional problem of, uh, and not to cast aspersions on anybody, uh, I don't know any of these people personally, and, and you know, I, I'm not saying they're bad, but there is a sort of Chris Saliza type um, that, you know, presents things with a certain, I would say, often false equivalence, uh, and, you know, just sort of fetishizes sort of the dance between the two sides in a way that feels kind of disingenuous and not helpful either. Um, I don't think that's at all what you're presenting. You're just trying to let different people uh, present their views, but there may be a sort of an extra stigma to centrism for that very reason. And again, I wouldn't call you centrist. I just am saying you are to trying, to, trying to reach both sides. Uh, yeah. Right. Most of the argument. Yeah, I think I somehow have to make this a feature, not a bug. Um, the, uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, just, just, uh, you know, we, we've, we've talked about making, you know, I mean, I've been talking to various people for various uh, lengths of time about because I was, I was, I've been worried about the problem of tribalism for a long time. This isn't just Trump. I mean, things have been becoming more and more polarized. Uh, for years, and I've been talking <clears throat> about this to people since long before he was elected, um, 
And, uh, you know, uh, I've talked to people about, you know, establishing an actual project to combat this, you know, uh, or or a, an actual, you know, uh, like a tribeless tribe kind of thing. Right. What do you think of that brand, tribeless tribe? Uh, could be hot. I, I'm I I'm not a branding expert. Uh, I don't know. I think we might need something a little poppier as a name. Uh, poppier but, in the sense of I don't know. Just maybe just uh, something something grabby, something sexy. Uh, hard to say. Like, See, that's the trouble with me. I think tribeless tribe is sexy. That's why I'm not the person for this job. No, that could be. I, I think there's also. I mean, it's just it's it it, it 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 remains as hard to recruit people to that cause with the name as without it is the other problem. Um, I also think tribalism, though you know, I that is the sociological term or political scientific term, whichever it is, is people don't think of themselves as tribal. It sort of maybe has weird connotations. So I think possibly that term itself is. Uh, is it deterrent in some small degree? Oh, I was almost thinking of the opposite problem where, like, everyone does have a tribe. Like, they're saying, wait, you're saying I have to abandon my Irish heritage? No way. Or, yeah. you know, like, I want my tribe. And, of course, the point would be, no, no, we all have tribes. The point is we should only have allegiances to tribes that do not depend for their identity and energy on hostility toward other, you know, real genuine hostility as opposed to competitive uh, fervor uh, against right. uh, other other tribes and and the idea is also your ultimate allegiance is to humankind and no one tribe right and I mean the you know Jonathan Haidt has written about this and uh, you know m my worry is that the only thing that can unify us is conflict against a different yeah. uh, some out group you know that the 9-11 did the job to some degree in some sense for a while but not only was it bad in the sense of our, you know, whatever interventions we took thereafter in Iraq uh, and arguably Afghanistan, but that uh, that wasn't real tribalism in any sort of understanding sense. It was just sort of a reflexive, you know, defensive posture. Yeah. Um, so, well, the other thing is ultimately the unification needs to come at the planetary level. I mean, you know, tribalism within the United States is one problem. Um, yeah, but at the same time, ironically, the anti-globalists are themselves going global, right? I mean, yeah. Steve Bannon feels an affinity with uh, Marine Le Pen. Yeah. So it's it's you know the the problem of tribalism ultimately has to be solved at a at a global level, and that leads us to the standard scientific science fiction motif of you know invaders from uh, some other planet finally unifying the Earth, like in the day the Earth st stood still or whatever. Right. Um. So, okay, so I'll go back to the drawing board on the on the brand. Um, but oh, there's a whole bunch of problems associated uh, with that. But I do think it almost needs to be explicit. I mean, uh, 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 that this is what you're about. That you're actually trying to fight the psychology of tribalism. And y you may... Uh, you may not be able to get a big following for that right now, but whoever whoever's interested can uh, join in. Right. Um, I mean, I think you know the I, there is. I think within each. Well, I don't. I, I don't know that the Trump tribe really even has any sort of veneer of this. I think there is a sort of identity politics based. Uh, you know, theoretically, we are all one tribe through. You know, if we just sort of eliminate discrimination of various types. I think that the farther left thinks that, you know, we are all one tribe in terms of a working class and, and that that could, that the tribalism we're currently living through is largely false and that if we sort of recognize our, you know, unity as a class, I, you know, I would be all for that if that happens. I don't know that it will. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's the problem that, that, that often the, the, desire to dissolve tribal lines just involves drawing different ones of people's choosing so right um yeah and at the same time i mean there are people who accuse i mean that's a big source of tension you alluded to between the kind of far left and the identity politics liberals 
Yeah. And one accusation, I mean, the accusation from the right is that identity politics is the tribalizing thing, and that's the problem. They're trying right. to tribalize this by ethnicity, uh, according to that critique. Um, right. And and the, that the and there's an argument that white nationalism is an identity politics that formed partly in reaction to that. And um, so there's that mess. Um, why don't we? We're almost out of time. Let, let, let's just uh, close on something not not totally unrelated to this because it. It is related to speech codes, including identity politics related speech codes. The Bill Maher thing, where he recently got a lot of attention for using the N word and then uh, apologizing. Yeah. Do you have a take on that or on him? Uh, the one figure in American comedy I do not feel bad about casting aspersions on is Bill Maher. I'm not a fan at all. Uh, I think he's, I don't think he's super funny. I also think he's very smug in a kind of an unearned way. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the sort of new atheist style um, imputing of religion. I didn't grow up as a believer myself at all, but uh, it just feels very pointless and, and self-aggrandizing to me. Uh, and he's just sort of an asshole. Uh, and this was an example of it. He used uh, the N-word to refer to himself in a failed joke. Uh, it, you know, it just sort of bantering with Ben Sass of Nebraska. It didn't have to go there. Um, the idea that it popped in his head and he went with it, um, which was his defense that, you know, comedians are sort of at the mercy of whatever words pop in their head. Uh, I've always found it to be sort of a silly one. Um, and, uh, I think, you know, he did this sort of apologia of an episode where he talked to, I think Michael Eric Dyson and Simone Sanders and some other people. And then, uh, Ice Cube came out and just sort of eviscerated him very calmly in a way that I found very satisfying. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it was sort of a masterpiece of, of failure. Uh, uh, you know, it was... And you think it was an actual failure? Because I had the notion that maybe it was uh, more calculated than he let on. I mean, it's almost hard to believe that he hadn't decided to at some point seize the opportunity to break that barrier and get the attention and so on. I mean, it's such a well-known barrier, right? Yes. I mean, I don't know. Do you think I'm, I'm being too cynical? Well, I, I believe, and I, I could be wrong about this, but I believe I read that he actually used it on his previous show, Politically Incorrect, on ABC. And I believe there it was bleeped out and maybe even edited out. I don't know. But I, I think this is a a third rail he has at least tried to touch mm. before. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, there may have been something calculated in it. I mean, I think that, you know, there's a certain type of comedian that sort of prides himself on going there and doing something sort of daring and whatever. Um, maybe it was calculated, but if so, it was completely witless and I don't think helped his show one bit. Yeah. Um, no, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan. Uh, have you seen his documentary on religion? What's it called? I have not religious. I, yeah. I, the just his smugness even in the in the trailer was more. Than it's I really, it's really pretty bad. Yeah. Um, it, it, I, it, it reminds me a little bit of the parts of Michael Moore that I think there are to not like, where he's just taking regular people and. You know, there was some of that in uh, what was the first one on GM? What was it called? Uh, Rock. Sure. Yeah, uh, but but anyway, I'm 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 I'm. Uh, no, and I think I I think that you know I do think that there is a, a critique that some have on the right and and on the left too that I agree with is there is a sneering that takes place against uh, certain types of people that is counterproductive. Um, I think Saturday Night Live actually has a lot of a surprising number of sort of one-off sketches about what you might call, you know, white trash or rednecks or something like that, that are pretty condescending. Um, and, you know, I think there people on our side, there's a lot of sort of impugning of Jeff Sessions, which I think is 100% deserved, but a lot of it manifests itself in how silly he talks. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, a Southern accent is not an inherently laughable thing to have. Um, and I think, a, you know, a huge weapon that Trump had was, although he is not laughed at for the same reasons. One of his messages was those people who laugh at you also laugh at me and right. we can get back at them together. Um, so I do think that that is a type of comedy that, 
if there's one type of comedy I would like to see less of it is that for mm -hmm. sure okay uh, well listen uh, we're up right at an hour where we usually try to stop um if not before then uh, but um what is there anything else you want to plug that, that you're working on now that we didn't mention uh, or that, or they, or that is just out there for people to discover, as everything is these days, right? I mean, everything is watchable somewhere. Yeah, um, I work for a show called Superstore. I like it a good bit. Um, very nice folks. I have uh, not seen it. Uh, I'm sure I would. Uh, where can I see it? You monster! Uh, it is. Uh, on <laughs> I, I like do not watch TV, but but where can I see it? I get it. It's on uh, NBC Thursdays at 8 p.m. Uh, and this I believe it's like a real TV show. This is on actual NBC. It is, yes. Uh, and I believe you can find re reruns on Hulu, uh -huh. uh, which is an app. Well, I'll watch it then. Now, are you, as a, are you a producer of episodes or a writer or what? I'm, a, I'm listed as a supervising producer, uh, and I have written a couple episodes, which, you know, even when your name is on an episode, that it was still a collaborative process. Um, but so I, I am not, you know, one of the captains of the ship, but uh, I'm happy to be on that ship. Uh, and if... I think you can still find other space on Yahoo. Um, that was a fun, silly little trifle. About that has that. a cult following, right? It it does a little bit, I think. Um, and it was a lot of fun to do. Um, I think it is probably dead, but uh, but celebrated as it right, was. The long tail. Yeah. The long tail will save you. Yeah. There you go. Um. And just quickly, what I noticed in your IMBD credits. There's a ton of episodes of a number of shows that you are producer of. Uh, many you are writer of, but some you're producer of. What does a producer of a show do? That basically just means I'm a writer. Um, uh, there, are, I mean, producing is sort of a vague term, but uh, if you're a writer on a show and you get promoted year after year, the titles change. You start as a staff writer, then you become a story editor, executive story editor, co-producer, supervising producer, uh, consulting producer, all these different things. So... Generally, a lot of the people that are listed as producers on a show are just members of the writing staff. There are other people that deal with logistics and, and various other things, but uh, I do very little of what I would call producing. Uh, it basically just means I'm a writer who um, got a, a silly title slapped on there. Okay. And also, of course, people uh, should follow you on uh, Twitter. W what is your Twitter handle again? Uh, it is O-N-L-X-N, a phonetic uh, readout of my name. Uh, which Endlessly satisfied by. Um, yeah, I don't know that I can actually recommend my uh, Twitter in good conscience, but uh, I enjoy it, so uh, people should feel free. They should, even though you are on the verge of disavowing the, the tweets for which you are most famous. And yeah. perhaps to torment you, we will actually link to them and make even more people aware of them. Oh, you monster. Uh, and uh, I guess I'd like to plug Blogging Heads as well. I've been a fan for a long time. Uh, if anybody is here just because of me and not because of you, first of all, that uh, reflects very poorly on them. I, you so. know, I was going to make that same point, but it, it sounds a lot better coming from you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, and second of all, this is a website worth uh, checking out and uh, sampling frequently. Uh, I think you guys do good stuff here. So keep it up. We're trying. Well, thanks so much. Maybe you can come back and talk to us uh, down the road as the uh, world continues to unravel. Indeed, and uh, I'd just like to apologize. I uh, have had my laptop on my lap, and I think the view has shifted up and down as I have fidgeted, so uh, next time I'll work on that. We call that dynamic hey. programming at Blogging Heads. That's that right. Was, it was dynamic. Yes. It's sort of a cinema verite, if it, you will. That, too. Yeah. Wh um, what were you going to say? <laughs> you go first. <laughs> well... We're at, we're ending on a on a high note here. Um, yeah, no, I've I've just been a big fan of your work and uh, and the work of Aria and everybody here. So uh, thanks for having me on. Aria a gets a shout out. He's a real comedy buff. Is he? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have that sense from his Twitter, but uh, I'd like to talk to him about it sometime. He will be deeply gratified. In yeah. fact, he would have preferred to do this conversation instead of me, but I kind of big footed him out of the way, oh. as is my prerogative, being In the head blogging head. Indeed. Yeah. Um, I have questions about Mickey, but another day. Okay, so you will definitely have to come back. Okay. And we can talk 
trash about Mickey. Do you ever see him in Southern? You live in Southern California, right? I've never met him. Uh, I think I actually saw him once um, and thought briefly about accosting him, but did not. Oh, go ahead. He would love it. Yeah. The guy's not exactly drowning in approval these days. He he needs it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. given the given the open Trump support, you know. Yeah. Um, well, contrarian's got a contrarian, you know. Yep. And he's doing an excellent job of that. Reminds yeah. me, we got to have him on. Yeah. Uh, so, but next time you're on, we will talk Mickey. Okay. All right. Sounds- well, thank you, Owen. Thanks, Bob. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye.